Okay, so today we're going to be talking a bit about global warming. We're going to look at it from a couple different perspectives. But, sorry, first we have to um, define some of our terms so that we know uh, what exactly we're talking about when we say certain words. Okay, so first, weather. Weather refers to atmospheric conditions at a particular time. For example, the temperature, humidity, wind, barometric pressure, precipitation, all of those kinds of things. When you talk about weather, you're talking about a specific instant at a specific location. Right now, where I am, it's about 34 degrees and there's, it's windy at a certain, you know, um, certain speed. It's not precipitating at all, but there is probably a bit of humidity in the air. Now, where you are, that's going to be different, and even three hours from now, my weather is going to be different. Weather is constantly changing. So that takes us into the area of climate. And climate is really more of what we're talking about when we talk about global warming, or at least it's um, the start of what we're talking about. And climate com comprises the average weather conditions present in a particular location at a particular time of year. And climates are measured over several decades. So climate is going to be something like in the um, northeast United States, winters are generally uh, cold and wet where and there's you know a certain amount of precipitation that could be snow it could be um, rain whereas if you go to like the Rocky Mountains winters are going to be very cold because there's a higher elevation and there's going to be a lot less precipitation but it's going to be all in the form of snow and this is again sp uh, specific for a particular location and you have to get that data over several decades, not just several years in a row, but several decades to the point of, you know, an entire lifetime. It takes one or two lifetimes to really establish the climate of an area. So then climate change is just any kind of change in the long term, uh, a long term change in an area's weather. Uh, average weather. So, you know, just because there's one winter that's a little bit warmer or a summer that's cold and rainy, that doesn't change the climate because it has to be long term. And even again, since climate is measured over several decades, even three or four years isn't really considered long term. Even 10 years isn't considered long term. We're talking about several decades, 30, 40 years that is what we need to actually be seeing a large difference as far as climate change. Now when people talk about global warming, this is the idea that the entire Earth's surface is warming. This is very different than all the other terms we've talked about so far because all the other terms are very dependent on the location that you're talking about them. Again, climate is going to be very different for uh, northeastern United States versus the southwestern United States. A very different type of climate. Going to be very different as compared to Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Southern Africa. All these places are going to have a very different climate. Global warming, you know, it does have that word global in there. It's talking about a global change and that the entire earth is warming up. So that is definitely a big difference compared to all of our other terms. And one of the issues that comes along is that um, in popular science and in the media, people will kind of just use the term climate change and global warming interchangeably. And um, that, that is not accurate because climate change can encompass anything, whether we're talking about more precipitation or less pre precipitation, uh, higher temperatures, lower temperatures, it could be anything, whereas global warming is specifically that warming. Okay, so one of the um, main focuses uh, for the global warming advocates is that carbon dioxide, the rise of carbon dioxide is increasing the Earth's temperatures. So um, these graphs should look pretty familiar. 
sorry, I had to adjust my microphone. Um, these graphs should look pretty familiar. Over here we have the carbon dioxide concentration and um, I've looked, because this graph goes through 2010, I've looked into it from the um, the site on uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii and in t by the end of 2014 we were at 390 something. So it is continuing um, that similar, that same trend uh, but you can see we've gone from about 320-ish, 315, 310 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide, con uh, pieces of carbon dioxide per million pieces of the atmosphere of any type, about 310 or so in 1950 to about 390, I think they measured it at 393 or so in 2014. So that is a change. It is definitely getting higher, but, you know, is it enough to really cause the entire Earth to heat up? Is it enough to cause the entire Earth to heat up to the point that there are going to be, you know, disastrous consequences for all of creation? Well, we'll have to look at that further. Over here, we also have sea surface temperature over years. Now they're looking at a much smaller timeline from 1975 to 2010. So actually about half of, um, not half, maybe two-thirds. I keep thinking it's 2000 and not 2015. Anyway, um, so we're looking about two-thirds of the time and we do see that there is a bit of a, a positive slope here but it's much smaller. Um, maybe, you know, maybe a degree or two. Now, one thing that this leads to is another logical fallacy about um, correlation versus causation. Correlation is just that two things are happening at the same time. For example, um, children are eating a lot of ice cream and, you know, the tar in the street is getting gooey. Um, those things do not cause each other, however. If you, if you think about it, when people eat more ice cream, that's the summer. And then summer we have more direct uh, sunlight and so, you know, the roads are going to get hotter and any tar is going to um, get softer. So the cause is actually, you know, a higher, higher temperature. There is still a correlation between the amount of ice cream eaten and the solidity of the tar, but that does not mean they cause each other. There does, there is clearly a correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the temperature. Carbon dioxide is going up, the temperature is going up. Definitely both things are happening. But the question is, is carbon dioxide actually causing the temperature to go up? That is, um, even, even by uh, global warming advocates, that is still a question that they are researching. It is their hypothesis that carbon dioxide is the cause, but they're still researching it. They don't have any firm proof at the moment. So then the question becomes, where's all this carbon dioxide coming from? And the obvious answers and the, um, I guess the popular answers, the talked about answers often are from cars, power plants. We have all these, you know, here it says carbon dioxide rich emissions. So basically it's the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, so all this carbon dioxide is coming from the burning of fossil fuels, which, is, which are plant and animal remains that have um, been buried over time, and instead of becoming fossils, they've become coal or oil or natural gas, things like that. Okay, so that is one source, and that is the big source that the media likes to talk about, because that's what, in theory, humans could control. We could drive less, we could use electric cars, we could switch to solar energy instead of, you know, uh, relying on the coal power plant. Um, and so that, that's what they like to talk about as the source. Um, those are really only big contributors in well-developed countries and a lot of the world is still not so highly developed as to have you know, two cars for, per family and large, massive uh, 
fossil fuel power plants. Another big contributor for all this carbon dioxide is basically us, the plants and an well, the animals that have been put onto the earth that God created on the earth. All animals, when we breathe, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So, you know, that that's not something they like to talk about too much because clearly there are more people than cars in the world. Um, because, you know, you can't say, well, we're going to bring down carbon emissions by killing people. You, you can't say things like that. So that's something that, you know, uh, the environmental scientists tend to overlook. But that is a big factor, you know, populations are rising and that is, of course, adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The big, uh, so then how do we get rid of all this carbon dioxide? Other than just not using it, other than not burning the fossil fuels, the big answer is plants. In photosynthesis, plants bring in carbon dioxide and water and then sun energy and they convert that into sugar and oxygen. The sugar they use for their growth and development and the oxygen they release uh, back into the atmosphere. However, once uh, that only happens during the day because photosynthesis is dependent on light. So then at night they go through cellular respiration just like every other uh, animal <laughs> and that actually produces more carbon dioxide and then once the plants die they continue to give off carbon dioxide for the entire um, period that they're decomposing. So in all, actually, plants are not really getting rid of any carbon dioxide through their entire life cycle um, all the way to the time that they are done decomposing and they're completely reabsorbed into the earth. It's just um, while they're alive, which for the case of the very large trees in places like the rainforest and things like that and those these big old growth forests they're taking in so much more carbon dioxide and then they're storing it for so long that it's kind of easy to forget that it's all going to come back out when these plants then die and decompose so the big push right now and has been for several several years is to save the rainforest you know we don't want to be chopping down and burning down those trees because they're taking in all of our carbon dioxide and they're going to save us from global warming. Well, that's not really the case. So the big question is, does it matter? Does it matter that we're expelling all this carbon dioxide and that plants that should be, uh, you, you know, helping us with this carbon dioxide, they aren't, and that maybe we're burning all of them? Well, there are four main points that um, environmental scientists like to point to for evidence of global warming. Uh, they're glaciers, the actual amount of carbon dioxide that's in the air, the climate, and the temperature. So glaciers um, in general are created when warm water evaporates and precipitates at the poles. So uh, the issue with glaciers is that scientists say, environmental scientists say that when the earth warms up, the glaciers will melt and then coastal seas will be flooded. The problem with that is that then um, the, uh, the seas will be flooded, but then there will be less ice in the area, less ice near the poles, and that will cause the poles actually to warm up. That water will warm up and warm water evaporates better and then you'll get more precipitation. So it is a cycle. It is a nice cycle that when there's warmer water it's going to directly lead to eventually thicker glaciers and larger ice sheets because that warmer water is going to then um, cause more precipitation which is going to then solidify into those ice sheets. The issue we're having now is that the glaciers are melting slowly and that's actually happening then you know with this uh, evidence because the waters are getting colder and that is you know directly going against global warming. Um, another issue that they like to point to is carbon dioxide that the levels of carbon dioxide are getting too high and so that's going to be dangerous for us directly and it's also going to hold in too much uh, energy from the sun. Well, carbon dioxide is necessary for life. 
Um, even if all you eat is, you know, one form of meat or another, that meat had to eat a plant somewhere along the line. You know, if, if all you eat are hot dogs, that pig still was eating corn at some point. And so carbon dioxide is absolutely necessary for plant survival. And if there were no plants, there would be no people. And um, carbon dioxide also is uh, being treated as a pollutant. And in that larger article that you read, they go through and talk about um, mining regulations. And because uh, all those gases in the mine, you have to keep a close eye on them so that miners don't asphyxiate. And they've determined in recent years that for carbon dioxide to be dangerous for people, it has to be up to 5,000 parts per million. Well, right now we're at 390. We're nowhere near that. And actually, um, as you go, the increase in carbon dioxide, as, since that does... Uh, feed photosynthesis, an increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually beneficial to plant life everywhere. Um, it's also used in some uh, nurseries and greenhouses as a direct fertilizer and in some greenhouses they'll increase the carbon dioxide level to you know uh, help plants. So again plants are necessary for our life and the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere the better it is for them. So having more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually beneficial to all of these plants that we need so much. Uh, the climate is something that clearly they point to and they're saying well you know we're having all these storms and we're having in deserts and heat waves and all these things but the climate has been changing continuously since the flood. Uh, before the flood Evidence looks like the Earth was much warmer um, overall, globally, and there was actually a lot more carbon dioxide because there were a lot more plants. And then the flood came and buried all that carbon dioxide and created these reserves of fossil fuels that we're using now. And then since that, the, you know, that whole, it was, you know, a year that the Earth was covered in water that really changed the way that energy this energy from the sun interacted with the planet and that changed the climate drastically and it's just been continuing to change ever since then and again if you look at things like you know water evaporates better when it's warm things like deserts that have a lack of water, a lack of precipitation those are actually caused by cooler seas so the fact that we're getting more deserts is evidence that the seas are cooling, not that they're warming. The last uh, part that they talk about a lot, the scientists talk about a lot, is that the temperature. Um, it's been mentioned in a couple of different articles, Al Gore's PowerPoint presentation, um, An Inconvenient Truth, his book and his movie, um, An Inconvenient Truth. And in, in his work, he talks, he states that over the last hundred years, the global temperature of the Earth has risen by one degree Fahrenheit. Now, if you look at um, how frequently our weather stations are spaced, there are not enough weather stations to make an accurate assessment of a global temperature. According to the um, National Weather uh, Bureaus, you have to have a new, if you're going to move a temperature reading station, a weather station, five miles, you have, it becomes a new one. You're not just moving the old one, it's a new one. So to have a reliable temperature for the world, we'd have to have temperature stations, temperature monitoring stations every five miles and more when you get into um, the mountains because you have to have one every hundred feet of altitude. So we just don't have anywhere near enough and again and our article also talks about um, the fact that most of these monitoring stations are at places like airports or cities or other places like that that are surrounded by asphalt and concrete and these are materials that really absorb and hold on to heat and that therefore distorts the the temperature reading and in a city um, I've lived in quite a few different suburbs and 
when we get the temperature reading from downtown, it can be three to five degrees warmer than it is where I would live in the suburbs. So if you're looking at a three to five degree difference just from being downtown as compared to the suburbs where you have more green space, a temperature rise of one degree over a hundred years becomes really insignificant. So in the end, um, it comes down to the fact that you know, God created the world and he created it with a certain amount of carbon dioxide and a certain amount of oxygen and he created plants not to regulate atmospheric gases but as food for humans and he created animals um, again not to regulate atmospheric gases but you know <clears throat> for well in the garden for you know basically for companionship and then later they became a source of food but the world was not the world was created in a stable state and God still takes care of that and as um, after the flood all of the carbon that was in the plants and animals that perished that was all buried and so that is a reserve and so there's probably a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere before the flood than there is now and things have just again the climate has constantly been changing since the flood and it just really shows us that despite our actions despite our burning fossil fuels and you know, keeping lights on all night and driving Humvees all over the world, we're not really very significant in the grand scheme of everything. God created the world and he created a sustainable system. Um, and he gave us dominion over it. So it's not really inherently an issue when we decide to cut down and burn a tree. The tree isn't upset. People people can be upset but um, the tree isn't upset because the tree isn't really a you know it's alive but it doesn't have a soul it doesn't have a consciousness and God isn't upset because he gave us dominion now on the other hand God gave us a responsibility and he's going to ask for an accounting of that so it's not like we should just cut down all the trees just for the fun of it we have to be responsible with how we use the world and we want to make sure that we leave enough resources and protect the resources um, that we have for future generations but uh, based on the the evidence and based on the lack of evidence from the environmental scientists it doesn't seem to be that we are causing a global climate change and you know God, God is in control and he's gonna make sure that life continues for as long as life needs to continue so that if something is happening he'll work his you know he didn't set the world in motion and then just leave it he didn't you know wind the clock he's still involved and he will continue to be involved and he'll still continue to take care of his creation for as long as he deems it necessary